thank everybody for showing up to listen to me today. Um, this is the season that we think of the birth of Christ, is the beginning of the road to salvation that ends with his death on the cross. So a lot of things have been popping up through my mind over the last several months, leading or weeks leading up to this. Now, have you ever met someone that you deemed to be a lost cause or someone that is just very difficult to love? Someone that no matter the consequences they face, the trials they go through, they just seem to not care and just reject everything we uh, do to, to steer them in a better direction. And in frustration, we utterly we just give up. We tend to write these individuals off as wholly and completely lost to the world. A world that cares very little for them or their eternity. So, in this frustration, they, they just continue to lie to us, lie about us. They're going to hold their immoral values as being immoral or as moral. Now, I get this as frustrating for us, to say the least. We care about their eternity. We want to see people come to Christ. But are they truly lost? Are their sins any worse than ours? Do they deserve the same forgiveness that God has shown to us? I think many of us would agree the answer is actually yes. But do our actions emulate that answer? Every single one of us here is guilty of sinning not only against God, but also against our fellow man. We tend to have this kind of selective memory, this amnesia about our own sins or how we sin against others. On the flip side, though, we tend to remember every single time someone has sinned against us, now don't we? Who are we? Are we special? Are we really any better than those that have not come to know Christ or follow Christ? The one who is still lost to this world, are we better to them? My friends, that is what it really is. They are lost to the world. Convinced by Satan that they do not need God nor his forgiveness. We ourselves are not by no measurement worthy of God's forgiveness either. We are wretched people in need of a Savior, every last one of us. And so are they. There's the commonality. We're both wretched. There's just one difference. We found Christ. One of my favorite speakers is a man by the name of Francis Chan. And he once said, God's definition of what matters is pretty straightforward. He measures our lives by how we love one another. It's pretty straightforward. There's a lot of truth in that statement. How do we love others? Well, in Matthew 22, 37 through 40, Jesus puts this way that it is actually a commandment to us. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is equal to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. See, the Greek word used for commandment here is entoli. This means injunction or order. That's pretty straightforward. It's an order. We are clearly being given direct orders to love everyone, not just ourselves, not just our fellow Christians, everyone, to show the same grace shown us to those who are still lost to the world. We are to lift our brothers and sisters up in the name of Jesus, for his blood was shed for all people, not just a select few. Now, in the book of John, Jesus is put in a very risky situation. And the Pharisees and the scribes were trying to trip him, to test him, to prove he wasn't who he said he was. And it starts in chapter 8, verse 3. I'm going to read 3 through 6. 
The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. Having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law of Moses, we are commanded to stone such a woman. What then do you say? They were saying this to test him, so that they may have grounds to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. Now this woman had obviously sinned. She committed adultery. She sinned against God. She broke the law. She sinned against her husband. But Jesus was obviously aware of this as well at the same time. Yet, even though she deserved the punishment that they sought to inflict on her, Jesus had a heart of compassion. But he also had the foreknowledge of his purpose here on earth, to abolish sin. Laid out by his father. The story does not end there. Jesus uses this as an opportunity to teach. In verses 7 through 9, but when they, when they persisted in asking, him, he straightened up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone. And the woman, where she was, in the center of the court. Every last one of us is absolutely guilty of sinning against God as well as our fellow man. Should we be stoned for our sins? Should we stone others for their sins? Should we receive the punishment we also rightly deserve? Is God's grace only for a few of us, a select few of us? Is there names written on that cross if these are the people that we are going to be forgiven by? I often, often wonder why we find it so easy to accept that grace from God in his forgiveness and yet so difficult to show grace and forgiveness to those still lost in the world. We write them off. Now, Jesus, being who he was, sought to forgive those whose hearts were penitent, that their actions literally showed that regretted their sinful actions. Now, 10 through 11, Jesus uh, says to the woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from here and sin no more. Jesus had all the authority through his father to condemn this woman, yet he chose to show her grace instead. How many times are we presented with this opportunity to show grace to somebody who does not deserve it? Yet, how often do we do it? It's so easy to dismiss, to say, well, that person is a liar, a thief, a drug addict. Jesus commanded us to love one another. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And as his disciples here on earth, that's definitely something we should take seriously. In John 13, 35, Jesus says, By this they will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, does that extend just to our church family, our immediate family, or does that extend to the homeless person on the corner? That intolerable co-worker. And one way we express this love is to have a heart full of forgiveness. You see, we serve a God who shows us an immense amount of grace, love, and forgiveness. We are called as children of God to do likewise and to extend that same grace, love, and forgiveness to others, especially when they do not deserve it. We are to be the living examples of Christ, his hands and feet, and as such, live as he commanded us to live. Remember, we are all sinners and deserve to be punished. Yet, even though we do not deserve to be forgiven or to receive the grace that God extended to us through the cross, his love for us is stronger than any of our transgressions. Look at the events from John 8, 3 through 11. The woman was obviously a sinner. She committed adultery against her husband. She sinned against God. And in Moses' law, she was to be stoned to death. But Jesus showed a different way, forgiveness. Jesus knew full well that that woman had sinned, and he extended his grace to her instead. This is the message of the cross, my friends. If we are truly his disciples, 
his followers. If love is truly imprinted on our hearts, then this should be our action. We should enthusiastically exude the love that Jesus does. So my friends, this is my challenge to you. Let us go out into this broken and fallen world as living examples of Christ Jesus. Let us learn to forgive those who do not deserve to be forgiven, just as we have been forgiven, though we do not deserve to be forgiven. Thank you.